I thought yes. you said the, I thought you were referring to the seed of the woman, the seed of the no, serpent. No. Um, what verse are you specifically specifically referring to? I'll go ahead and I'll pull that up right now. Well, there is a the Genesis. Uh, let's see. Verse. Yeah, I thought, uh, I thought you said seed of the woman. That's why I completely. Yeah, no, seed of the serpent. So who who's that? Genesis three fifteen, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman. So he said that's uh, the woman and and uh, thee, and then between thy seed and her seed. So who's the seed of the serpent? The seed of the serpent. I've really never really given it much thought. I guess um, I guess we could view it as um, I guess being um, those that rebel against God. I suppose I really have never really given it much thought. Who well, the seed of the serpent could be? I really exegeted that term uh, much. Okay, thanks very much. I don't have any further questions. Absolutely. Okay, Turn and Fan, you now have your 11-minute negative constructive. You may begin when you're ready. Thanks very much. Today we are talking about the so-called Immaculate Conception of Mary. This doctrine provides an interesting viewpoint on the trend that you, we may be seeing in the debates between Mr. Albrecht and me. Mr. Albrecht seemed to think initially that he could prove the veneration of Mary from scriptures. But by the last debate we had had on the perpetual virginity, Mr. Albrecht had shifted largely from the scriptures to the church fathers. And now Mr. Albrecht is in a bit of a pickle. The scriptures don't teach the Immaculate Conception, and the early church doesn't seem to teach it either. In fact, as late as the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas denied the Immaculate Conception. While between then and the 19th century, which is when the doctrine was finally defined, there were folks who came to believe it, this is not something that is an especially ancient doctrine. It is not something the apostles taught or believed, and it's not something they handed down to us. By the time of Trent, the doctrine had made significant inroads. Thus, while, to talk, while talking about original sin, Trent explained, This same holy synod doth nevertheless declare that it is not its intention to include in this degree, where original sin is treated of, the blessed and immaculate Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, but that the constitutions of Pope Sixtus IV, of happy memory, are to be observed under the pains contained in said constitutions, which it renews. Now, that's a reference back to Pope Sixtus IV, who had published an essay in 1470 to defend the doctrine, and instituted the Feast of the Immaculate Conception in 1477. So, that brings us to the first question uh, that we'd like to think about today, which is, why is this doctrine there? Well, the scriptures don't teach it. It's not something that's really necessary for the faith, even though uh, the, the definition of it suggests that if you don't hold to this doctrine, you're making shipwreck of the faith. But why is it there? One, well, number one, it exalts Mary. It makes her out to be greater than she otherwise would be. Number two, there's a, a way to try to connect it to Jesus by saying that it's needed to protect Jesus from original sin. Now, Mr. Albert hasn't made that argument. I want to be absolutely clear about that. But uh, if the argument is made for that purpose, well, Mary needed to be holy in order to, ha to bring forth Jesus without original sin, well, that would, that's another reason that some people have given, and uh, it, there may be some intuitive uh, sense that we'll get to the problem with it a little bit later on. Number two, how did this doctrine appear? Well, it was defined by Pope Pius IX on December 18, 1854, at the you know the second half of the 19th century. But it has been taught by Rome since the 1470s, as I mentioned a little earlier. And it was taught by Duns Scotus, who died in 1308 in the uh, 14th century. That's the beginning of the 14th century. So the, we see some of it in the 14th century after Aquinas, and then we see it uh, growing until a trend kind of makes an exception for it. It doesn't really come out and define anything, and then uh, by the 19th century, something gets defined. Now, does this doctrine make any sense? Scripturally, the answer is no. Number one, within this discussion on Scripture, there are passages that speak to the universality of sin. And Mr. Albrecht pointed to one of them, which had to do with the fact that it says all have sinned. And that does deal specifically with personal sin, but it doesn't make much sense to have the Immaculate Conception with uh, without original sin, but with personal sin. You know, that type of doctrine doesn't make much in other words, no one, there's no group of people out there that holds to the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception who will say that Mary had personal sin, just no original sin. So it is, it is important. And in the context, the, the context has to do with sin being passed down from Adam. So it is talking about the curse of original sin that's being passed down to all, which then evidences itself through the concupiscence that's given in original sin, in actual sin, in the people who then imitate Adam, even though they don't imitate the exact sin that he had. So, in fa And in fact, there are other ways that Scripture uses the term all, but the only proper sense in the context of that particular verse is to understand it as 
each and every person within the category. And I would take exception to Mr. Albrecht's claim that all Israel doesn't refer to the uh, to an, a group uh, that's extensively each and every member is being referred to. It's talking about spiritual Israel, the elect, and each and every one of those spiritual Israel will be saved. The same thing that all of uh, creation groans and travails in childbirth, that may simply be referring to uh, a very large generality, but it, sh it surely seems to be practically the case that every single being that gives birth to children has some kind of child pangs from women, even if they have a, some kind of – the only way they avoid it is by drugs or something else, but, but generally speaking, they all have this, this pain. It has to be fought some way. So it does seem to have been intended in an exhaustive sense in that passage as well. But, but not, nevertheless, the question is, what's the context in this particular case? And the context in this particular case suggests that universality is intended, with Christ as the only exception to that universal statement. So the second, though, is that Mary, the second scriptural reason why this doesn't make any sense is that scripture says that Mary said that God is her savior. Now, that doesn't make much sense if Mary doesn't need to be saved, if she doesn't have sins to be saved from. The Typical counter-argument is that she's saved from sin the same way someone might be saved from falling down the steps by having a gate put up between them. But Scripture never refers to that as salvation. Scripture only refers to salvation through redemption. And Mary didn't, wouldn't need to be redeemed unless she had sin. Number three, there's a real problem because Mary did have personal sin, and we'll see that in three and four. Number three, Mary viewed Jesus as though he were crazy. And I, I say that because in Mark 3, we have the discussion of the multitude coming together so they couldn't, there, couldn't, there was not even room for them to eat bread. And when his friends heard of it, they went to, out to lay hold on him, for they said, he is beside himself. That means he's crazy. And when we go read down the passage to see who it is that are showing up, it says, there came then his brethren and his mother, that's Mary, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And so this is, unless you're going to read Mark uh, 3 as simply never telling us who these friends are, and some translations say family there, but if, if you're never going to sit, find out who these friends are, that's one way of trying to interpret the passage, but the normal way of reading it is that these are his relatives, his mother and his brethren, who came to take him away because they thought he's out of his mind, he's beside himself. Then uh, the next that part four is Mary didn't properly honor Jesus. Now, of course, thinking he's crazy is probably not that honoring in the first place. But we see in Mark 6, 4 that Jesus told the people in his home area that a prophet is not without honor. In other words, he is with honor everywhere except but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. Now, Jesus wasn't married. He's referring to the house that he grew up in. And he says that he that that's the one, one of the few places where he was without honor. So that suggests that Mary didn't give him the proper honor that he deserved. Next, we see in John 2, 4, where at the uh, Cana wedding incident, he tells her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come, which sounds a lot like a rebuke. And again, in Luke 2, we have the situation where, G where Mary and Joseph leave Jesus behind at the temple. And when they find him, Mary tries to correct Jesus by saying, Son, why hast thou dealt with us, uh, thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. So they didn't, Mary didn't have an understanding of the purpose of Jesus at that time. She didn't understand what he meant by his father's business and the fact that he had to be about it. And she wasn't properly honoring him at, and respecting him at that time. It's not to say that we, we are trying to insult Mary in any way. It's not saying that she's an exceptionally ungodly person, certainly, but there's no evidence here that she was personally sinless. And without the evidence first of personal sinlessness, there's no absolutely no reason to think that she was immaculately conceived and preserved from even original sin as well. Next, the, the next question is the logical question. So scripturally, there's no good reason to think this doctrine makes any sense. But logically, well, if God could prevent, this is number one, if God could prevent the spread of original sin for Mary, why not for everyone? Why wouldn't God give this sanctifying grace to everyone at conception? Since it's not merited, we made, uh, it, was, it was very clear that it's not merited in any, any sense that we could identify, why not give it to everyone? Why, why give it only to Mary? It seems to have done...